Well, have you ever continued, though? I, I know we've got emotional and physical here, but what qualifies in God's eyes as an affliction? Because when I said misery and being squashed, when I said emotional and physical, it's still not clear. I know that there's a million questions out there, and if we stopped right now and put out the microphone, you'd say, well, wait a minute, does this count, does this count, does this count? Well, the Bible goes a step further. Because whenever we ask a question, the way to answer that is to trace that topic as it unfolds in the Scripture. And one of the great ways to do that is to study the first occurrence on. For example, do you know when the first time grace shows up in the Bible? We all talk about, you know, this morning we were singing marvelous grace. The first occurrence of grace is in Genesis 6. It's in the context of Noah and the flood. And it says the whole world, every imagination of the world was only evil continually. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Grace is most evident when the, the, the greatest sin, where sin abounded, grace abounded more, right? That's where the, that comes from. And so where sin was rampant, God's grace is first seen. How about love? Where's the first time love is in the Bible? It, the law of first occurrence is just such an amazing way to study the Bible. First time love is in the Bible? It says that a father loved his son. And he loved him so much that he took him up on a mountain and was going to kill him. That's how much he loved him. The first time love occurs is when it says Abraham loved his, son, his beloved son Isaac. And isn't it interesting that the first time love occurs in, in Genesis 22, it is a father who loved his son, but yet was willing to sacrifice his son. And the ultimate expression of love is in John 3.16, when the ultimate father loved the ultimate son so much that he what? sacrificed it, like we talked about this morning, as the Passover lamb. Well, the first occurrence is great. So if we look up affliction for the first time in the Bible, do you know where it shows up the first time? In Genesis 16. Now, you, you can turn there, but I'm not going to be there for a little while. But, but we're going to go through these. So if you want to go somewhere, go to Genesis 16. But let me read to you all of them. Because if you study the word affliction, you'll find it occurs 37 times in the Old Testament. The first time it occurs in Genesis 16. But if you carefully look at the Hebrew words, there are seven different forms of affliction that God says are, are a category that I will bless you if you go through. Genesis 16 has the first one, and God says ill treatment by others qualifies as an affliction. When we're ill treated, when we don't deserve it, when just because they don't like us for how we look, how we act, who we are, where we're from, or whatever, they don't like us. We could call it discrimination. We call it repression. We could call it prejudice. But whenever we're, there is ill treatment by others, God says that qualifies as an affliction. In Genesis 29, God says a lack of love qualifies as an affliction. You get into a marriage and you expect to be loved and you're not loved, that qualifies. You're, you're, you're suffering a lack of love, which is a form of affliction God recognizes. In Genesis 31, God says, lost wages and broken promises of those that employ us qualify as an affliction. Now, some of you might be going through the General Motors thing. I mean, my dad worked for General Motors 46 years from when he was 17 years old until he was 63 years old. He retired when he was 63 years old and he made more money every year until he died last year. That was the GM dream. He had every benefit unbelievable. I mean, they called him multiple times saying, you haven't used enough. Please come in and spend more, you know, get a new hearing aid, get more glasses. It was the ultimate benefit package after 46 years. They're taking that back so fast. It's not funny. I still get his GM retire me, retiree emails. I think I lose something every day or he did. He's not alive anymore, but man, they just send out these emails. They say, we're sorry, we're sorry, we're sorry, we're sorry, we're sorry, we're sorry. The salaried men, no, you don't get that. No, the hourly, you aren't going to get that. We're going to scale this back. Do you know what? I'm not saying that General Motors is an afflictor, but God says lost wages and broken promises that you counted on in good faith. I don't mean believing that if you pay a dollar an acre, you'll get oil out in California. That's foolish. You know, if a thing sounds too good to be true, it's probably not, right? That's a sign in the post office. You ought to believe it. If the offer is too good to believe, don't believe it, okay? But if someone promises, and, and you have every reason to believe them, they promise you something, 
and they break the promise. You'll see in Genesis 31, God says that's a form of affliction. In Genesis 41, God says when you're hated, when people are jealous of you and betray you, that qualifies as an affliction. In Exodus 3, God says underpayment and overwork qualifies as an affliction. You know, God is really into just weights and measures and wages. And God puts many warnings out to the rich and says, don't shave, don't cut the corners of your field. You know what rich people were supposed to do? They had square fields and they were supposed to harvest them in a circle. Why? To leave for the poor people the corners. The rich already owned the whole field. They already owned the whole crop. Why are you going to go to the edges? That would be being greedy. That would be being inconsiderate of people that don't own fields and don't have crops. That's why the Lord said, if someone walks through your orchard and picks an apple and eats it, don't bother them. Let them do it. But if they bring a basket along and start throwing in, take the basket away from them. But if they just walk through, see, God is a big one for the rich, always sharing with the less rich. And so when the rich cut the corners and keep, you know, lowering the pay and expecting more work. God says, I hear that. In fact, James 5 says, Behold, the, the hire of the laborers kept back by you rich cries to me, and the cries have entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. And he says, your riches will, will turn to canker, cancer. In other words, he said, you'll, you'll never enjoy your riches if you're, if you're stingy and if you're greedy, if you're kind of like Scrooge, you know, and do that. In 1 Samuel 1, a sixth form of affliction, God says the inability to have children qualifies as an affliction. Remember Hannah? What was wrong with Hannah? Nothing's wrong with Hannah. She just couldn't have children. And you know what God said? I have felt your affliction. Now, for Hannah, he gave her Samuel and then a bunch after that. But that doesn't always happen. But the Lord does say what happens. He says the children of the desolate, those who never have children, are more than those of the fruitful, those that have children. Why? Because if you have children, it takes a long time to raise them, take care of them, and they kind of hang around for the rest of your life. And if you don't have children, you can focus more on the Lord. And so you can have more children. A lot of people that have never either been married or never had children can disciple more people in their life than those that have had children. So there is an offset. Remember Paul said, I would rather be single, get more done for the Lord. But the Lord says he knows. And the inability to have children qualifies, we'll see in 1 Samuel 1, as an affliction. And finally, here's the seventh one. In 2 Samuel 16, God says, Unkind words, slander, and accusations that are unfounded, and insults that have no basis qualify as an affliction. So let's go through these. If you're struggling emotionally or physically right now, stop and reflect on the lives of these Old Testament saints, what they faced, they faced hatred, jealousy, betrayal, bad job situations, family disharmony, infertility, verbal insults, accusations, and unkind words. And those were the afflictions that God made them great in. Let's look, first of all, at Genesis 16. So go back with me if you're not there yet. 1611 is where we're going to be. Genesis 1611. Remember, the verse numbers weren't put in until... The 16th century and the chapters didn't come along till the 12th, but I'm so glad they're there. It helps us to find stuff together. But in 1611 of Genesis, it says this. And the angel of the Lord said to Hagar, behold, you are with child and you will bear a son and you will call his name Ishmael. Because the Lord has heard your affliction. Hagar. Ishmael's mom. He was, the Bible says he was a wild donkey of a man. That is not a positive description. He happens to be the father of all of the Arabic people and, and, and all of those in, spread out. He, his son, he intermarried with the descendants of, of Esau and, and Ammon and all of them. I mean, he is the granddaddy of this whole thing going on right now, the Arab-Israeli thing. And you know what God said? I'm going to give you a son, Ishmael. Because I've heard your affliction. Did you know that God had compassion on the mother of the Muslims? Mother of the Arab people through which Muhammad came. 
Think about that. In God's sight, being ill-treated by a jealous and vengeful boss is an affliction. Hagar's boss was her mistress, Abram's wife, Sarai. Sarah was jealous when Hagar became with child by Abram. And Sarah held Hagar in contempt. But God said, I am the God who sees your affliction, Hagar. It's not right for Sarah to mistreat you this way. So I will bless you. I mean, that's just off the charts. I mean, we're such, and we should be, such fans of Abraham and Sarah. But Sarah was wrong in how she treated her servant her mistress, her her husband's concubine. If you're mistreated by someone who has authority over you, and if it's making life hard for you at home or at work or at school, God says, I want you to learn from me in that situation. I know what's going on, and it will work good for you if you let me. Remember what Romans 8.28 says? And I know this, and we know this, that God works all things together for good. Did you know that it was good for Hagar to have Sarai as her mistress? Because Hagar got to experience God. She, if you read the 16th chapter, uh, I mean, it's amazing what, what the Lord says to her. How he treats her. How he allows her to see. In verse 13, look what it says. She called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees. And she, she said one of the, one of the intimate names of God that, that we still sing in our worship songs. He is the God who sees us. And God revealed that to her. Why? Because her boss was mistreating her. Can you imagine if you go to work tomorrow and get mistreated and instead of getting stressed and needing, you know, take some pills or take time off, if you just say, wow, God, I'm going to learn something new about you. I'm so glad I work at this horrible place where they mistreat me and don't pay me enough and overwork me so I can learn more about you. Now, see, what happens then is it releases God to take vengeance on the bad boss. You see, that's why it says in the Bible, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I'll recompense. As long as we take things into our own hands, as long as we say, if they mistreat me, I'm going to have a work slowdown. In fact, that's why my father, Mr. General Motors, Mr. UAW, would never participate in the strikes. He didn't like that work slowdown, you know, bring them to their knees. And, you know, I'm not going to do any political commentary here. But God's method is... Hagar did not start dragging her feet and spilling the goat's milk and burning everything to show, you know, how she thought of Sarah. God says, you just, you just go back and read the chapter. Go back and serve Sarah with all your heart. I'll take care of you. I'll give you a son and that son will have 12 sons and you will be the mother of a great nation. And, and the Arab world excelled in mathematics and arts and the sciences. I mean, it's, it, the only blight is the horrific, bloody, uh, Islamic, satanic, uh, jihadistic evil. But the, the Arab culture is marvelous. Do you know anything? I mean, their cooking, their science, their architecture, everything is beautiful. And that's part of the blessing through Hagar, through Ishmael. And I'm sorry that Satan found an inroad and, and that's working into the end plan. But God blessed Hagar for going back to her evil boss and submitting to her and doing whatever she said. And God says, I will bless you. Ill treatment by others qualifies as affliction.